So let's get started. I will ask each panelist to address a number of questions that I have before me and share their insights and um, information that I think we'll all benefit from. Uh, the first question I'll start with Patty uh, Hill. Patty, what has been the biggest impact of COVID-19 on your clients? Well, I think that probably all of us will say that the isolation of COVID has been the, um, the biggest problem for my clients. It's been the highest, the harshest impact, I would say. And when I look at the isolation, uh, I'm probably looking at it from the perspective of whether or not there's somebody available to make decisions for someone who may be declining. So we have people who are isolated, they may be living alone. If they're not able to be with family members or other loved ones, they may decline and nobody will notice that decline. And I think that's my biggest concern. And so what I found um, you know, a long time ago, when my father first um, became sick with Alzheimer's, I didn't see him for several months. And then when I saw him, the decline was um, pretty noticeable. But during that time period, he had issues with uh, paying his bills, with making healthcare decisions, with all of those kinds of things. And so that's what I worry about most for my clients right now, is that there's, if they're not with their family members, there's nobody there watching to see if they need help, if they're paying their bills, if they're eating, if they're taking their medications. Um, so that's what I think is the biggest issue for my clients right now. Excellent, thank you, Patty. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, um, I'll, I'll pose the same question to you. What have you seen as the biggest impact of COVID-19 on your clients? Yes, it's, um, isolation is one thing, but job loss is the other. Uh, since my clients are the full spectrum of, uh, of all Medicare recipients, um, the people that were working there, I mean, uh, there's so many companies that have either furloughed or gone out of business or uh, and people have lost their jobs. So here you are 65 and older and you just lost your job. It's difficult to find a job once you turn 60, 65 years old and now you're devastated. Um, so these people find themselves at home isolated just like the people that I work with that are in nursing homes. Um, <clears throat> and those people have li are literally on lockdown. I mean, I still have, have people that, uh, that I'm personally involved with at the moment that have not been able to come out of their room. So the one good thing that Medicare did soon, right out of the gate <clears throat> with this is telehealth was offered to everybody as a result of COVID. So the, you can get your mental health or behavioral uh, appointments through telehealth. And I think that's been a really, really good thing. So that's the biggest impact that it's had on my clients. Excellent. Thank you, Bonnie. Barbara? Um, I would have to agree that isolation has been one of the most profound impacts. Um, I've been working as much, if not more, during the pandemic, and I have had the, the pleasure to work in a number of support groups, and I've been staying in contact with people that have Parkinson's and their families, and um, the isolation has really taken a toll on a lot of the people. And... Um, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's a learning curve to uh, find ways to stay in touch with others and family members. And um, also that, um, um, you know, just keeping that personal connection. I think that's been so profound. And the ripple effect from it all where they, they can't see family like Patricia touched on. Um, they are maybe not getting their diagnosis. They know that they they have a problem, they know that they think it might be Parkinson's disease, but they've delayed going to the doctor. And um, so there's that ripple effect, not getting their medications like they should. And um, so, yeah, I think that, that that has just been the most profound impact on our families. 
Excellent. Okay. Um, our next question is, how has COVID-19 changed the way you interact with your clients? And what are the unique challenges that that presents? Uh, Bonnie, I think we'll start with you this time. Okay. Um, well, my business in me, because I'm a touchy feely kind of person, I always enjoy sitting across the table, looking eye to eye with somebody and seeing the expressions on their face as I went over all of the different Medicare plans. Uh, I always do an educational part on Medicare to begin with. And so I could see there by their reaction if they were understanding. It's like, are you tracking with me? You know, and just, you know, ask questions like that to make sure so I could explain something or try to put it even in more simpler terms. But with this COVID thing, I mean, it was like overnight, we went from that or people coming into the office to uh, having to do everything online. So <clears throat> the good thing about technology, I mean, thank God for technology, <laughs> let's just put it that way, because so instead of in person, we were uh, doing events like on the computer, Sometimes we did Zoom events where they were actually looking at us and, and we were looking at them or using their iPad. We can send them all that information, then get on the phone and call them. Some people didn't have a computer or an iPad or an, or an email. So with those people, as long as you had a smartphone, you were good to go. So my thing is, I'm a senior myself, and I know it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks, but if you have a flip phone, get rid of that sucker. It's time to come into the 20th century and get a smartphone, because with a smartphone, you can do anything with that as far as Medicare is concerned and getting enrolled and learning and all that. The other thing is... Um, I did have one client who could not do, could not use his technology for anything. So we resorted to faxing and the good old fashioned way, the mail. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Very important. Um, Patty? Well, I think the same thing. I'm, as an estate planning and elder law attorney, uh, I usually meet face to face with clients. And when we're planning, when we're talking about their issues, we're often talking about some very personal things. We talk a lot about their families, um, you know, and especially if they have family issues, they're going to tell me about those. And so it's always a very intimate conversation. And I find that um, right now we're pretty much working at home. And so we're meeting mm -hmm. with clients on Zoom, we're doing conference calls. And while I appreciate the technology and the ability to be able to see clients and to have them see me, um, I am not picking up as much uh, on the body language as I would if we were sitting across from each other. Mm -hmm. So a large part of my business is explaining things to people, is teaching, is asking questions to make sure that I understand what they want. And I really don't think that I'm quite connecting as well as I did when we're not face to face when I can't see them and, and look at their body language. Um, but the good part is that we are able to meet with clients. Uh, we haven't shut down at all. We um, do Zoom, we do conference calls. When we have to explain documents to clients, we're able to do that um, either by email, we email the documents and then go over them by phone or we're able to share our screen with the Zoom. So that's been great. Um, when we have to uh, have clients come in and sign their documents, they're driving up to my, my office. We go outside and watch them sign. So even though we can get the job done, and um, I feel that it's necessary right now to get that job done, I am missing um, the connection with my clients and feel that that is missing. So, And also, uh, there's the issue with technology. Um, I'm sure that if most of you work with uh, seniors, and some of them have never uh, been on a video conference before, and so oftentimes we'll spend the first 15 minutes of that conference trying to figure out how to get connected, and, and that is a little awkward, but at least we get to do it, so it's all good. <laughs> and I think that's something um, I share with each of you because, 
in my business, uh, I was accustomed to having to go and meet clients face to face, either in the hospital or rehab. And now I can't do any of that. And it really puts me at a disadvantage because I always prided myself on being able to put my eyes on the client, you know, to see for myself what was going on rather than just taking the word of a, of a family member. And it's really a disadvantage. And of course, family members are reluctant to, you know, make a decision on an assisted living community because they can't go in there. They can't smell, they can't see, they can't touch. So it, it really has uh, been difficult, but we're, we're, we're still managing to help uh, place uh, clients and, you know, we're making the best out of a difficult situation. And thank God we have this technology because if we didn't, who knows, <laughs> I don't know how we would get the job done. So that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what would you tell the audience um, to do differently going forward? We, we've gone through this. We've learned a lot. It's been, you know, shocking to all of us. Um, but, we've, but what would you say are some key learnings or some ahas that you've, you've figured out um, that you want to you wanna help our audience plan for, you know, Hopefully we'll never have this again, but you know, who knows what may be something worse. What would you say would be the thing that we need to plan for, particularly if we have elderly parents or we're, you know, we're getting on up there in age ourselves even. Um, Barbara, let's start with you. Okay. Um, I, uh, I think that one of the main things is it has opened up our world to everybody across the world, literally. We have had people join from other countries to join support groups. And um, that has been a bright spot that we have offered programs to people and they've told us uh, that they otherwise would not be able to participate. So I would encourage people to try to embrace that. I know there is that learning curve. We hear from doctors on telemedicine calls that they spend you know, maybe 15 minutes just trying to get the patient uh, in and get, you know, get their computer working correctly. But I would tell them, if at all possible, get back on that old-fashioned telephone and give us a call. Um, we have used that quite a bit, and it's, it's really uplifting just to give a call and talk to people and keep them engaged. And, uh, of course, being careful with technology and some of the things that can be uh, dangerous to some of our senior people. Uh, patients and families, but to embrace it as much as possible and to use it. And um, I've been really pleasantly surprised at the number of people that have gotten on the calls, the Zoom calls, and joined for support <laughs> and hearing how well they're doing with their telemedicine and just how, what can be done at their telemedicine visits. And um, so I would definitely tell them to embrace that. Uh, there is a lot of information out there, sometimes an overload that I've heard too from people. Um, there's just so much. Uh, we, for one thing, are putting together a calendar to help families coordinate that so they're not overwhelmed. But uh, engaging in that education because um, I think when you get um, overwhelmed and nervous, you tend to push back and you don't want to engage and you isolate yourself even more. So we really encourage people to stay engaged and um, utilize that information. And um, I think that also brings a sense of comfort because when you're educated and you really understand what's going on and understand like in our case, understand the ins and outs of Parkinson's disease and that it's something that you can live with and manage um, that just brings such a sense of relief to a lot of people. We have a lot of young onset support group members, and that's something we really focused on. And these are people in their 30s with young families. They're also working with their parents in a lot of cases and trying to take care of them. So um, just educating them and letting them know that all of this is available to them. It's right in their laps, literally, in their living rooms. And um, they can take advantage of that and, and use, utilize us as a resource. Um, we have a lot of great board members that are resources. Victoria, we work with her as well. And these are people that are accessible. Our national office is accessible. And there's just so much out there that I would just ask everybody to embrace and don't be afraid to reach out there and, and take advantage. Very true. Lots of, lots of resources out there for folks. Uh, Patty? So my biggest aha moment, uh, and I've known this all through my career, but uh, was really how many people 
don't plan ahead for um, crises. And especially during this time, because what's happened is that many of our governmental institutions, our financial institutions, have not been very accessible during the, um, especially during the first months of lockdown. So I have, as part of my practice, I do guardianship and conservatorship uh, for people who are not able to make significant decisions for themselves. Um, I also do probate when someone has died and their estate needs to be probated. So all of those things take place in the probate courts and the probate courts are not functioning at full capacity even today. And so we have had uh, cases where we had to apply for guardianship so that somebody could make decisions for another person. And it's probably taking twice as long to get through that process as it was before. And so, you know, that my thoughts are that people just need to figure out ahead of time, they need to do their planning. So in order to avoid a guardianship or a conservatorship, we could have had um, financial powers of attorney, advanced directives for healthcare. We could have had trusts in place uh, that would have avoided all of that. So, you know, my aha moment was just, we just really need to make sure that people are planning ahead. In addition, um, I've changed a little bit of my philosophy of practice during this time period because I've had several clients who have died and their families, uh, because of the probate courts being so shut down, have had a really difficult time uh, to manage their estate after their death because it's taking so long. And so I've started with my practice um, recommending trusts on a much more regular basis because that will avoid probate. And generally you can um, get access to estate assets pretty rapidly with a trust uh, and don't have to worry about going through a court process. So those are kind of my aha moments is just two things, plan ahead and try to avoid probate court. Excellent. Bonnie. Yes, well, um, some of the, um, the different communities and centers where I teach classes, they have had to resort to conference calls because they're, um, the people that attend there or that live there don't have any type of technology. And then also I've had clients have to drop off their paperwork at my office. The deal is not everybody lives near my office, right? And on a conference call, you can't actually see what we're doing. One of the, the, the biggest things that since the beginning of time and the reason I got into this was education. And so it is so important for people that are that uh, need to learn about Medicare is the education part of it before they just enroll in a plan. So that's, I have uh, 14 team, team members. Most of them are around the Atlanta area. However, they are in other states. So people can get with one of them and they can walk them right down the way. But um, for seniors in general, not just about Medicare specific, you know, they should take classes and they need to learn more technology because like you said, I don't think this is the new normal. I think this is the next normal. And, um, and then going back to what Patricia said, planning, I think everybody on the planet, if you're 18 and older, you need to have a POA because if something were to happen to you, like what just happened worldwide, you need somebody who does have that knowledge of technology, who can take care of you. And if you lose the ability to like um, understand something and sign on your own behalf, I cannot do anything with your Medicare plan unless you have a POA. So again, Patricia, thank you for doing what you do to help all of us do what we do. Um, and then I would like to leave you with one final note. Always, sunshine is the best medicine and it doesn't have a $35 copay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice, Bonnie. <laughs> vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D. 
Yeah. All righty. Um, so the the last question before we before we get into the well next to last question is and I think some of you shared a little bit of this already, but you know we pur I purposely titled this the talking about the next normal because we we use the term the new normal. This is the new normal. This is the new right. normal. But we really need to we really need to know know what's next. I mean, and how do we prepare for what's next based on what we learned from, from this pandemic? So my question is, what would you say is, quote unquote, not the new normal, but the next normal for seniors and their families? Um, uh, Patty, I'll start with you this time. Well, I, I don't know if this is the new or the next normal, but I remember from 2008, 2009, when we had the last uh, economic downturn, that a lot of families moved in together. So we had multi-generational families living together. And I think that's, what's, I think that's where we're going now. Um, people are concerned because they haven't been able to be with their elderly loved ones for a long period of time. And so I think they're going to move them home um, as much as they can. And try to find care at, in the home. So I think that's one of the, the next normal. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, again, technology, is that we just, we kind of, um, I don't know, let people have a pass on technology. I don't know if that's the right word, but I think that we are gonna have to emphasize that people have to learn technology because this is the way that our world is. We, this is the way we communicate now, so. Having to, I think, um, make sure that people are educated about how to use their smartphone, how they're educated on how to use a computer, and that they have that technology available to them. Um, otherwise, they're going to be even more isolated um, than they are right now. So that's what I think is next. Okay. Great. Barbara? I would agree that um, we definitely have to embrace technology. I think that... Um, it's, it's just commonplace. I think that most people, that's our next normal. It, it pretty much is now normal, but um, we will have to embrace that technology. I think also that we are moving more toward our home and staying at home. We can get our groceries delivered. We can do our exercise at home. Now we can see our doctors at home. But um, like Bonnie alluded to, I, we have to maintain some socialization and still make an effort to get outside, to have that communication and not allow ourselves to be depressed and isolated at home. And right. I think that, you know, depression is definitely something that has been top of mind. And um, unfortunately that is, has come to be commonplace and somewhat normal in some cases. But um, we, uh, you know, at APDA, we just encourage everyone to, use your technology, get that exercise, get outside and um, educate yourself on what's available and um, keep active. So we hope that'll be the next normal that people are advocating for themselves. They're taking advantage of what's available and um, you know, we're right here to help them do that. And last but not least, Bonnie. Yeah, uh, ditto what Patricia and Barbara said. I mean, every single thing they said, uh, um, I believe that is uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, learning technology is, is number one on the list. Not being isolated, somehow connect with others. I have one of the most outgoing pe uh, people that I know in the entire world she called me up one day and we were just talking and I was like, so how are you doing, you know, with all this stuff? And she goes, I'm a hugger. And then she burst into tears. And I was absolutely shocked that my close dear friend of like 30 plus years, and, and then she just started sobbing, telling me. And I was like, <clears throat> you know, there's so many people that they don't want to admit it because um, I don't know. I guess they think that that makes makes them less because they are the people who throw confetti all over you whenever they meet you kind of thing, you know? So, um, yeah, so stay connected uh, in any way that you possibly can and get outside, you know, go for, go for a walk, do, do whatever you can, go to, to a, a park or, or something, but just stay, stay connected. 
Excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, each of you have shared some, some terrific insights and, and I hope this has been helpful for the audience. Um, before we get into questions and answers, and there have been several that have come into the chat already, and um, I'll ask any of you who want to put a question in the chat, we, we should have enough time to get through most, if not all of them. But before we get to the Q&A, um, I'd like to ask each panelist to tell the audience about either an upcoming event or just some basic information that you think would be helpful for everyone to walk away with today. Uh, Bonnie, I'll start with you. Okay, uh, the best thing is just to call my office and the numbers on there. Uh, I have so many uh, Zoom meetings coming up. So whether somebody is just sitting at home by themselves or if they go to a senior center or part of a uh, live in a community, I have some that are just closed for community specific, but I also have some that's open to the general public. And if you would like for me to do one for your group, please let me know. The month of September, I'm doing one on Medicare and COVID. <clears throat> and then of course in October, Medicare, and then what's new coming down the pike for 2021. Excellent. Barbara? Oh, I also, oops. Oh. Well, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, I also have an article coming out in the AJC and then, oh God, these people are not going to like me. I have something coming out in uh, Enjoy Magazine and Family Life Publications. Excellent. Thanks, Bonnie. Barbara? Um, in addition to all of our educational um, programs that are coming up, some of our programs are not just specifically for people with Parkinson's disease. It can be something like what we're doing today that can educate the community and family members. Um, so we have a lot of that coming up. We just recently had a, uh, a conversation, Dr. Rebecca Gilbert, that's our chief scientific officer, did an interview with Bill Rasmussen. Um, He's from ESPN, but he had been recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and she did an interview with him, and it was very uplifting and encouraging just to hear how he has lived with this um, disease and diagnosis, and um, he's turned it into a positive. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to go to our website and check out our educational materials, but also um, we have a walk coming up this Saturday. It's our third annual annual optimism walk, and uh, it's virtual this year. Everything's virtual, but um, we are doing an opening ceremony very similar to what we're doing this morning, and um, we are partnering with uh, three other chapters, and uh, so it'll be a lot of fun. We'd love to have you join us. It's uh, typically one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. Uh, every little bit helps, and the funds go to programs and services such as our programs for for um, patient aid scholarships where we are providing financial aid to people that can help them get transportation, it can help them get to a physical therapy appointment, um, which helps them also live safely at home once they get physical therapy and they don't have as much of a risk of falls. But um, we'd love to have you join us for the walk on Saturday. And uh, you can get all of that on our homepage and I put our contact info on the chat. And uh, we'd love to see you Saturday morning at 1030 and you don't have to get in the car and drive. So uh, it makes it even easier. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Barbara. Patty? So we have a series of um, workshops coming up uh, virtually, um, and it's geared at helping people who have to take over their, somebody else's life or finances, basically. Uh, we're going to be starting that the week of September 20th, and it'll be a monthly, um, monthly Zoom call for the near future. Hopefully at some point we can actually come in my office and meet. Um, so if you have anybody you know that is, um, starting to have to maybe make financial decisions for a parent or another loved one. Um, I'm going to be starting that on this week of the 20th of September. So, and if you want to find out more about that, go to my website, which is www.lrodhillfirm.com. And also I have a newsletter coming out in the next couple of days that will be discussing how to find a long-term care facility during the time of COVID. And um, Victoria has contributed a nice article for that as well. So if you, if you want some information on how to find a, a facility, um, 
email me or go to my website and our newsletter will be on there. Yeah. And your, your information is in the chat, correct? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. And then I'll just say that uh, my plans are to present this uh, format every other month. So our next Ask Me Anything will be in October and I will again have a uh, very distinguished panel of, of, of experts uh, and hopefully all of you will join us and you'll spread the word um, to your friends and neighbors. So at this point we've got um, we've got about uh, 15 or 20 more minutes and we're going to open it up for Q&A. There are several questions that are in the chat. I'm going to read those questions. If they're specific to a particular panelist, I'll ask that panelist to address the question. And if not, I'll, um, I'll just pick someone. So the first question is from Susan Ahern. Um, Susan, I, I don't know if you want me to share this, but Susan works for Kaiser Permanente. She is an excellent social, social worker for Kaiser and just really goes above and beyond with all of their patients to, to get the help that they need. But Thank Susan's you. question is to Bonnie. Mm. And it's, we are trying to pilot a transportation project at Kaiser. And our roadblock is the Medicare condition of participation that we can't provide transportation for some recipients. Uh, we, we, we can provide transportation for some recipients, but not all of them. Can you speak to that, please? Is there any way around that? Our heart failure patients can't get to the doctor, so they end up calling 911 and going to the hospital, which drives up all the cost. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a really good question. So all of these Medicare Advantage plans have their own uh, additional benefits. And mm -hmm. Kai Kaiser, just like all of the other ones, uh, can offer, so, but there's always a limit to how many uh, trips that they offer. Usually people that are on Medicare and Medicaid, uh, with some of the plans I have, they have up to 36 one-way trips. And the mm -hmm. reason why they do one-way trips is because they may <laughs> live with someone who, uh, maybe works and maybe they could get a ride to the doctor at four o'clock and then at five o'clock their loved one could pick them up so right. that's the reason why for the one-way trips but but every provider so that's just a Kaiser thing between them and Medicare um, so I'm not sure if it's a Medicare question as much as it is a well, Kaiser question because yeah. like all the other plans uh, all, not well, but not every plan. Okay, so I, I should say all of the other carriers offer some type of transportation, but it may be limited just to their Medicare and Medicaid plans. I mean, uh, uh, enrollees. Okay, so that's helpful to know because <clears throat> we've tried to partner um, Grady. Actually, one of their, I think it was their. It was either oncology or heart failure clinic did a transportation project and we were trying to partner with them to say how were you able to do that because everybody at Kaiser says <clears throat> this is a Medicare condition of participation that we can't provide transportation to some of our recipients and not all but what I think I hear you saying is no it's it's up to the individual Medicare plan provider of whether they want to provide transportation. You got it, it's, it's, it's Kaiser, it's, it's a Kaiser thing. So uh, talk to the, to somebody higher up the food chain that makes those decisions. Yeah. Oh, trust me, I'm driving them all crazy. Okay, okay, well, uh, listen, I have a feeling, I have a feeling you're the girl for the job. Yes, I like she challenge. is. <laughs> Go get them, girl. That's right, be relentless. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So the next question is uh, either for Patricia or Bonnie. When people get accepted for long-term disability with Parkinson's, is it generally for the physical symptoms or the cognitive symptoms? Uh, is it ever for cognitive reasons? At what stage of PD do folks generally stop working? Oh, God. That might be a, a Barbara, Barbara. question. <laughs> 
Well, I could give just a little touch. I could touch on that. Um, Parkinson's disease is just like any other disease. Everybody is different and they progress differently. Um, you can do everything, take care of yourself, but everyone really progresses differently. So there's no really set time. Um, one thing that people don't really consider a lot is that there are a lot more than just physical symptoms. There are a lot of cognitive symptoms, you know, sleep order, sleep disorders. It's a neurological disorder. So um, it, it's, it varies, you know, by, by individual. So you really just have to take it as it comes, I think. But, you know, as we've touched on before, planning ahead so that you're ready should that happen um, is very important. And we encourage that. Bonnie, do you have anything more to add? Uh, no, as far as long-term care, somebody has to, is that what the question long -term, was? Long-term disability. Um, long-term disability. Yeah. Uh, that's more, of, the doctor actually decides when they can, they have to have the diagnose, uh, and, and, and it can be mental or, or physical. So it's whenever, whenever the doctor actually diagnoses them as not being able to uh, perform, you know, because of, of having those, those issues. And then um, it's easier usually to go through an attorney than to try to do it yourself, because if you try to apply for it yourself, you usually get turned down three times and that there's a lot of time wasted on that. So it depends on one money. Money is uh, the beginning of everything, right? Okay. So uh, it depends on your budget and then, and also how soon you need, you need it. So um, that's my final answer. Patty, do you have anything else to add on that question? I don't really have anything else to add on that question other than that um, if somebody's not able to perform the duties of their position, um, I think they have to be out of work for a few months before they can apply for Social Security disability, but it is also a physician's determination. So that's what I would say. Kelly, hopefully that helps. Um, next question is, um, I've heard that some Medicare plans are now offering help with custodial care at home and possibly transportation. Is that true? Okay. Um, the transportation is, like I mentioned it before, some of the plans do offer transportation. Usually it's about 12 one-way to 36 one-way uh, trips. And that would be per year. So it's not like transportation you can depend on often. Okay. The question about uh, the custodial care at home, actually Congress passed something two years ago about this, but it happened right prior to open enrollment. So none of the plans had enough time to have a full understanding and integrate it. So to my knowledge, there's still none in the Southeast area. I heard that there may be some in some other areas of the United States, but nobody has put that information in front of my face. I've never had it in my hot little hand, but if I do, I'm gonna let all of my people in home care know about it because it would be awesome, even if they only had four hours a week, just to have yeah. some come That's in so care, exactly so the caregiver could have some relief so um that's uh, the other thing too this is going to be a large expense for the medicare advantage plans so uh, i don't know you know it's like if you start something new what are you going to cut because right. reimbursement as everybody knows with medicare is minuscule yeah yeah. yeah, so yeah. That's, that's really helpful to me because <clears throat> as one of the regional social workers, I get calls I mean, just yeah. several times a day on transportation and health in the home. I, that's, I talk about that all day long. And right. what I always say is what I'm sharing with you about health in the home is a Medicare rule, it's not a Kaiser rule. So you can call any other provider. And they're going to tell you the same thing. So is, is that information correct? There's still nobody providing custodial care in the home? Not, not, not in Georgia. 
not okay. not in Georgia, not in Tennessee, not in Florida. I mean, uh, you know, I'm contracted in all those states, and, and and no, there's not a single plan where you know I read in their benefits that that is something that is being offered. However, we do keep reading in the news, you know. Yeah that it has been approved. So it's been approved, but it's just not been integrated into any plan to be offered to the enrollees. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Sure. And Adam Sieber uh, owns a uh, private duty home care agency. He's on with us. Adam, do you have any other information to share with the audience? Um, as far as, you know, how it's paid for, um, not really, because it is primarily private pay at this point. I think one of the disconnects, though, that people in general don't understand about home care is that, so we get um, requests all the time for people who want um, four hours once a week right. or a couple hours a day, three days a week. And I understand the need for that. And there is a very real need for that. Um, the problem is if quality of care is what you want to provide, that that kind of schedule doesn't align with getting the best of the best caregivers. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a dilemma. It becomes a situation where um, home care becomes more of an hourly commodity than it does, um, you know, something that really represents a difference in a family. And when you have um, someone that is getting three, four hour shifts a week, should you choose to staff it? the turnover rate is very high because those caregivers are always looking for um, more hours. And so whenever that happens, it not only disrupts you and takes administrative um, toll on your, on your team, it also disrupts the client because you have to go in and they have to get comfortable with a new caregiver and all that kind of stuff. So it is a really, a really tough situation. And I actually um, spoke to a guy day before yesterday that, is in a startup that provides would provide hourly service or that intermittent service. Um, and I think there's some challenges in terms of his business model, but if someone cracks how to actually do that and do it successfully, yeah. it's something that needs to be done. And we've talked about shared services and, and having caregivers that are booked, you know, in, in two hour increments, we've done it in an independent living community. Um, but it is really, really tough work for the caregiver. And again, it's, it's really hard to get them. So not to be long winded, but that is one of the things that everybody needs to be aware of in the senior space. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we have another question here. In what condition, if any, should an older parent give away or sell their possessions, including their house, so that the state doesn't attempt to seize their assets after death if they, for instance, instance, put them in a state nursing home. Patty, do you want to tackle that? I can tackle that one. So um, I think what you're asking is if someone goes into a nursing home and has to go on Medicaid to pay for that nursing home stay, um, before they do that, should they give away their possessions and how far in advance? Um, the answer to that is, uh, you know, it's, it's depend, every person is different. So we always look at everybody's individual situation. But in general, um, for Medicaid, if someone gets into the nursing home and applies for Medicaid, the application asks them, have they given away anything in the last five years for less than fair market value? And if the answer to that is yes, then Medicaid will say, for about every $8,000 you gave away, you have to privately pay in that nursing home for a period of time. So the answer to that is, is um, it's not an easy question to say if they should give it away. It really depends on their financial situation and what type of care they may be needing. But the bottom line is that if they give everything away five years in advance, then Medicaid doesn't have the ability to see that, this, that transaction. And so I don't know look, if that answered the, the question. Correct. <clears throat> I would say, um, you know, Kellyo, I think it's Kellyo. If if that if you need additional information, uh, Patty, am I right that you will do some free consults with clients? Uh, we do some consultations, um, generally speaking, for um, 
if someone is requesting information about Medicaid qualification, we would do a, an initial consultation. We can't really give any, um, any legal advice about it, but I can give somebody the education about it so they can understand whether or not that's something they want to do. Um, so yeah, we do a consultation. And okay. they could just call my office um, and the phone number is listed on the chat and you can give me a call and we can set up a consultation. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Barbara, this question is, um, is having hallucinations a symptom of Parkinson's? Yes, that is a very real symptom of Parkinson's. It can also be a side effect of medications. And um, that is uh, something that you can talk to your doctor about. It's possible that they could tweak your medications um, to help with that. So definitely, it is very real and happens to a lot of people. And I would definitely suggest getting in touch with your doctor's office and letting them know. And I think that, you know, if I could just say quickly, I've talked to people, uh, of course, with Parkinson's disease families, and they're having some little uh, problem. And um, it could be just a matter of talk to your doctor, talk, find out if it's normal and what can be done about it. So don't, don't hesitate. It could be the nurse, you know, when you call the doctor's office, that the nurse will answer and um, they can help you. But uh, definitely talk to your doctor. And then... Uh, Patty, there's a question for you. How long does it take to get a POA done? Um, so is the, I guess the, is the question, how long can my office do it or what specific? Yeah. I think so. I think so. Okay. So uh, generally if it's just powers of attorney, um, I mean, we usually do a package with powers of attorney, wills, advanced directives for healthcare, but if somebody just needs a power of attorney, um, we can do that pretty much in a couple of days, uh, as long as the person can um, come to the office, like I said earlier, if they can drive through so we can watch them sign it because it has to be notarized and witnessed. So usually a couple of days. Um, sometimes we can get it done faster depending on our workload. Cool. And then uh, I have a question here. Would hospice be an option for some in home care? A doctor, I can answer that. A doctor has to write an order for hospice, so it depends. If the doctor writes an, writes an order, then hospice can begin, but if the doctor does not write an order, then it cannot. You can't just say, hey, we want hospice to come and care for us. And uh, one last, one other thing on that is that the, <clears throat> the number of hours that are allocated, it um, is small compared to what many people access from a home care perspective, but it's significant. And uh, our clients that are on hospice get a huge benefit out of that, so. Okay. And then, um, I'm not sure what, I don't know what this means and I think she's already left, but are there any specific attorneys that you would recommend, Bonnie? Um, the reason why, and, and Patricia just kind of said that, if somebody is in a hurry and needs like a POA and they live in the area where her office is, then she's the attorney I'm going to refer to. So it mostly depends on, on that. There are other elder care attorneys. Uh, that is, uh, you want to be careful because uh, it's just best to know somebody that you feel comfortable referring. Great. Well, I think those were, I think we got all the questions. If, if um, we have two minutes left, if someone else has a burning question that they wanna just unmute themselves and ask, please do so uh, in the last minute and a half that we have left. All right, hearing none, I will uh, say thank you, Patricia Elrod Hill, attorney, uh, Bonnie Dobbs, and Barbara Mooney. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and, and, and insights with us all. And thank you, guests and audience, for joining this Ask Me Anything 
uh, virtual town hall. I really appreciate your participation and I hope to see all of you um, in October for our next event. Thank you so much and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank, Thank you. you.